Hi guys and welcome to Book and Lube. We're having this is handmade and the best boyfriends are always found in books. So it's been a really shamefully long time since I've posted an I read it all video and I'm guessing that you guys probably think that I've completely forgotten about the fact that I've been doing this but I'm here to tell you that no I have not. I completely remember it. I've just been slacking on my reading and posting um since uh, the last time I posted I read it all which was in September which is now crazy long ago because we are officially into 2023 now um it is currently January 4th of 2023 as I am recording this um and so that means that we have about three months of I read it all to catch up on I read a total of one book in October, one book in November, and five books in December in order to total up for October, November, and December a total of seven books. So not great. Could definitely be a lot better. But we're not going to complain. We're just going to keep chugging on through. And so without further ado, let's jump into it. Back in the beginning of November, I gave you guys a quick video just discussing my thoughts on the books that I read in October and November. Um, and those two books were the Legacy of Orisha series by Tomi Adeyemi. So I read Children of Blood and Bone back in October, and then I read Children of Virtue and Vengeance in November. Um, and I recorded my first ever series speed run for I Read It All, where I talked about the Legacy of Orisha series. Um, I'll put a link up to that video there. Um, I'm not gonna dive too much into it in this video since I already have a full-length video already featuring just these two books. Um, just for those of you who don't know, um, Children of Blood and Bone or the Legacy of Arisha series follows the story of Zaley, Amari, and Inan. Um, and they exist in this world where there's such a thing as Magi. Um, and these Magi are kind of able to control these different, all different types of magical abilities and elements. Um, and Zeli is a reaper and she has the ability to control death. Um, and a long, long time ago, Amari and Inan, who are siblings, their dad, um, who's the king, um, decided to get rid of all of the Magi and leave just the Diviners behind, who are the children of the Magi who are able to one day become Magi, but they have to first go through a ritual that the Magi um, basically performs in order to bring the diviners into their full-fledged powers. So the king basically destroys all the magi, um, thinks that he has saved the kingdom. The diviners now are living as the lowest of the low in the citizen totem pole. Um, they're super poor, they're treated really poorly by everybody. They are like the lowest class that you could possibly be is being a diviner. The king discovers a scroll that has the chance to turn diviners into magi without using like the magi ritual that previously would have been needed and this obviously is very dangerous to him. Um, he tests it out on Amari's best friend who is a diviner um, and then after that slaughters her and that makes Amari kind of grab the scroll and run off um, and she runs into Amari and there's this whole prophecy that they're going to be able to maybe bring magic back to Arisha. Um, and so it's like a really, it was a really great story. It was really action packed and fast paced. It took me way longer than I wanted to, to get through it because of the fact that it was, um, like just so in depth in its world building. It took me some time to kind of go into that after reading so rapid fire, a bunch of contemporary books, um, to then have to go in and kind of like remind myself of like what it's like to read a good fantasy was a little bit difficult. Um, but I wound up really loving it in the end anyway. There's supposed to be a third book eventually. Um, I cannot wait for it to come out. I'm super excited. Um, hoping that we'll get some news of that soon. So those are the first two books that I read if I read it all. And like I said, I read Children of Blood and Bone back in October. And then I read Children of Virtue and Vengeance in November. And I keep wanting to say, and I even think I say it once, at least once in the other video that I posted. I always want to say Children of Vice and Virtue and I don't know why that's what comes to mind first. I don't know where exactly I got that title from but it is Children of Virtue and Vengeance. I would totally love to do a full-length book discussion um, in the library with this book. I think that it's really fascinating. It touches on a lot of different themes um, and it really covers a wide broad spectrum of a lot of things that are 
issues in our contemporary world, but are tackled through the lens of fantasy, which kind of um, allows the author as well as the reader to kind of open up that conversation in a new way that maybe would have been difficult to have originally um, without that fantasy lens. And I think it's very interesting. It was very good. I liked it. Um, so that is Children of Blood and Bone as well as Children of Virtue and Vengeance by Tomi Adeyemi. And I definitely recommend reading them. Super good. So the next books that I have for you um, are both by Dahlia Adler. Um, these are the ones that I started to read. I actually started to read the first one a little bit in November, um, but I didn't finish it until December. And then I read the rest of the books that I read in December. Um, so the first one that I have to talk about is Cool for the Summer by Dahlia Adler. Cool for the Summer tells the story of Lara and it, it, the book title is in fact Demi Lovato inspired um, and Lara's mom works for this businessman um, who has a house down in the Carolinas um, and so when it comes time for summer um, Lara's mom tells her that she is going to be going down to the Carolinas in order to um, be with her boss during the time that he's down there so that she could still help out on different tasks and stuff and that Lara is going to be coming with her. Um, while there she meets the boss's daughter um, and the two kind of hit it off right away and form this really unlikely friendship um, that maybe develops into something a little more. So while down there Lara kind of has this very um, transformative year, um, this transformative summer that she kind of really steps into herself and who she is as a person and she's more confident and she's kind of like taking all these different risks and like kind of just comes back to her senior year of high school with a totally new attitude and a totally new outlook on life. Mainly driven by the boss's daughter whose name is Jasmine. Um, so when she gets back to school, this boy that Lara's had a crush on for literally ever um, takes notice of the fact that Lara seems to be really different now and she's really confident and he kind of really vibes with that and so he kind of goes out of his way to kind of impress Lara and to get her to go out with him. And that would be fine and dandy for Lara if it didn't happen that Jasmine just so happens to be moving into her neighborhood as well as going to her school as well now um, and Jasmine's kind of pretending like she doesn't really know who Lara is so this was a really interesting read unfortunately I felt like this book didn't really hit it on the head for me um, I just felt like it kind of was a little rushed I also felt like the characters weren't as deep as I would have wanted them to be. Um, the conflict was kind of so-so at best as to why they couldn't be together. Um, so I wasn't overly impressed with this book. Um, I did think that the characters were interesting, but I just thought that they kind of were a little bit too shallow for my liking. Um, and my love for books really stems from the characters themselves and so having characters that couldn't really pull me in kind of um made me pull away from this book a little bit but I definitely think that it was an interesting book I wouldn't say I hated it but I'm not gonna say that I overly enjoyed it it kind of was like a very like lower lower middle of the road for me I know that like middle of the road is like my base level um this was like a very lower middle of the road I definitely didn't hate it but I definitely didn't really like love it either um and then that kind of like set me up to be nervous to go into the next book because the next book was Home Field Advantage by Dahlia Adler and I kind of was like nervous going into it and I forget why but for whatever reason I decided to audiobook the book instead of doing just like instead of reading it um and I can't say that it was really too much better for me um I did like the concept of the book this time I thought that it was interesting um so home field advantage is about Jack and Amber. Amber is like one of the top cheerleaders on her team. Her goal is to become captain. Um, she just really like l eats, sleeps, and breathes cheerleading. Um, she doesn't really have time for romantic relationships um, just because she's so focused on getting to the next step for cheerleading. Um, and then Jax comes into town. Jax. Jax is from Once Upon a Broken Heart. Um, then Jack comes into town and Jack is going to be taking over the position of the quarterback for the football team. Um, and Jack is the previous quarterback died in a car crash, um, but he kind of was like a really terrible person. Um, he was very homophobic and would constantly 
like blackmail and pick on um Amber's friend who's like her fake boyfriend um and because of that like Amber never really liked him so when Jack comes in and Jack is short for Jacqueline um so the whole school is kind of reeling from the fact that now they have this female quarterback I definitely enjoyed Jack's point of view a little more than Amber um but I still think that this was like the same issues for me as the last book where you kind of have um the characters were kind of like a little bit too shallow for me um I wanted more depth I wanted more um like feeling and introspection like for me I like when I mean like I'm the kind of reader that always falls in love with the villain character so I think that that's something that I always struggle with in romance books is that there's no like darkness for the most part to the characters um or if there is it's something that can kind of be overcome like I don't know like it's just like something that I've noticed a lot that I mainly struggle with romance books for like just straight up romance books and not like romance fantasy books because there is like I don't know something just like not like hitting it for me when I read those types of books um so I definitely think like these are books that could easily be enjoyed as like a light romance like a good summer romance book to read um but it wasn't just I just don't think it was like necessarily for me um and I hate saying that because I went into it wanting to love it like I love the idea of like this girl coming into this like predominantly or only male sport and like crushing the game and I thought that her whole arc of it being like that constant pressure and the constant comparison to this guy who not only was a jerk all the time but also is dead now um and kind of nobody accepting her for that um I also loved the whole like play on the cheerleader and the football star where you have it being a LGBTQ romance instead of it being like your everyday like male female romance story um I thought that it was interesting I thought it was good so I just don't think this is my genre is the problem and that's something that I knew when I set out to do this was going to be a problem for me was that I'm going to be reading so far outside of my genre that it's going to be a struggle that I'm going to come across books that like are inherently good but they're not for me if that makes sense so I would definitely say that both the Dahlia Adler books were good they just weren't necessarily for me strictly for the fact that it was just a straight up romance and it wasn't like a it wasn't like a fantasy I wanted to like the books and I tried so hard but it just something in me was like no and I hate saying that because I'm like so like give everything a chance but I don't know there was just something about them something I don't know and I'm curious to see now as I go this was like my first like romance that I came across as well like I kind of made a big deal when I came across my first fantasy series but like this was like my first romances that I've come across everything before this has been very like just like straight up contemporary um where you have kind of like struggles with parents struggles with immigration um struggles against authority you have thrillers like I haven't had just a straight up romance yet so I wasn't sure what it was gonna be like going into it um so I think I'm curious to see um in my future reads like what will be my re reaction or response to reading additional romances where the conflict is just these people can't really like be together or something like that so all right I'm talking about romance too much I gotta move on so the next two books that I have to talk about might actually be my all-time favorite books that I've read for I read it all so far um I have to say so far because I haven't made it that far in yet but when I tell you these two books were absolutely out of this world so good that I was so excited about it I cannot even tell you the third book that I read in December was The Red Ribbon by Lucy Adlington and oh my gosh it was out of this world amazing I could not believe it I do have a little bit of a thing for historical fiction I was like a big the book thief fan when I was in high school and I just love 
historical fiction. I love getting lost in history and kind of giving history more of a life beyond just like what you read in the textbook. Something about the red ribbon just like called to me. Like it was so good. So the red ribbon tells the story of Ella who is in one of the concentration camps during World War II. Um, and she is doing her best to try to survive in any way that she can. During that time in history, um, in, within those concentration camps, if you had a skill that you could work and you could be of use to the, like, basically the Nazis, um, they would allow you to work and they would allow you to live longer than your counterparts who didn't have any of these, like, skill sets that they were looking for. Um, and Ella is young, but in order to get to work, she has to lie about her age. So she lies and says she's 16, even though she's not. Um, and she is put to work as a seamstress. And Ella is a super talented seamstress. Like, she can just make amazingly beautiful things out of fabric. Um, she is extremely talented, like, so super talented. She forms friendships with other people within the seamstress area, um, most notably Rose, who's this very soft, kind-hearted girl who she, like, likes to tell stories and kind of keep everybody's hopes up as much as possible. Um, and Ella kind of takes it on herself to kind of protect Rose throughout the book. Um, so it kind of tells the story of this very, like, heartbreaking situation that Ella is forced into, um, in everything that she goes through in order to survive, um, and to make it out. Um, every step, every calculation, every horror that these people saw that were in these concentration camps during World War II, it's just, it's so heartbreaking to read, and I feel like this was the most influential book that I read this year out of all the ones just because it really had me sitting and thinking and being like wow this is like and so deep and I just think that it's a book that like everybody needs to read no matter what age you are um it's done so eloquently and you really like feel like you're there and that's like such like a weird experience because it's so like such like a disturbing time and the things that Ella goes through are so disturbing and upsetting and it's such like a horrible display of the worst parts of humanity that like you kind of like get sick to your stomach almost reading it but it's in a way that is like so important to understand history. I'm just gonna say that you should definitely read The Red Ribbon. It was so good. Easily it's tied for first with this next book. Um, and it feels so weird jumping from talking about The Red Ribbon to jumping to talking about the next book. Um, but the next book that I read was The Charmed List by Julie Abe. And yes, this is Abe as in A-B-E. Um, so I had mentioned a while ago that if we had gotten any new acquisitions at the library, um, I would use December as my time to jump back um, and read any of the books that we got that I had already passed the letter for. Um, and we got Julie Abe's The Charm List. Um, and so I went back and picked it up. And oh my gosh, this probably would have easily taken the cake for being the best book that I had read for I Read It All in 2022. Um, I cannot even tell you. It was so good. So amazingly good. So it is an urban fantasy. Friends to enemies to lovers book. Had all the amazing tropes that you just love. It had a road trip. It had share one bed. It had a million things going on. It was so good and so well written and such an interesting magic system. Oh my gosh. It was just out of this world so good that I literally finished reading it and almost like immediately started reading it again. If I didn't have to read other books, I read it all. Um, I definitely would have been rereading this over and over again. It was just so good. So Ellie lives in Silicon Valley um, within the Magic Aware community. And so the basically the Magic Aware community are these beings that, um, and it could be anybody. It doesn't have to be a magician or a wizard or anything like that. Um, anybody can be Magic Aware. You just have to be let into the world to kind of see it. Um, magic kind of floats in the air around us in the moments of joy um, and can be collected and turned into different things. Um, it's not so much like a 
open-ended magical world so much as it is you can create um food that if you eat it it will give you good luck or you can create um tea that if you drink it it will make you joyful so emily's family owns a tea shop and then across the square from where she and her family have their tea shop is jack and jack and ellie grew up being best friends when they were little um but unfortunately jack's mother died when he was young um and his dad kind of became this like hermity kind of grumpy old guy who just doesn't want to be bothered with anybody and he is very focused on his company um and basically their company is that they they sell these like magic infused stationary items um and ellie and jack kind of don't really get along anymore um they don't really talk anymore but ellie and jack's younger siblings are best friends so ellie and jack kind of always are like getting on each other's nerves and like bothering each other and then one day um Ellie tries to pull a prank on Jack that goes wrong and kind of makes somebody who's not magic aware now be magic aware. Um, as a punishment, um, Ellie and Jack's parents decide that they're the two of them are going to carpool and go down to this convention that's happening um, and they're going to basically have to work it out on their way. Um, they're sick and tired of them always being at each other's throats and so they're like, you know what, you guys gotta go. So it is just, it was such a sweet story. I literally just like fell in love with the characters. I thought Jack was really great. I thought Ellie was really great. I didn't feel like the relationship was too forced. I love things where you have like that friends to enemies to lovers because I feel like it puts the characters in such a unique position where they know so much about each other. Um, and even though they do on the surface hate each other, they can't help but love those parts that they do know or remember from when they were friends. So it was just so good. And I definitely recommend reading it. Um, it was just like one of those like super feel good, happy books that you're just like, oh, I guess now that I'm thinking about it. See, but this is different. So here, this is what I was saying earlier, how Home Field Advantage and Cool for the Summer were both just regular romances, right? So I would say that The Charmed List is a romance, but I would say that it was also an urban fantasy. So it had that magic system to it that kind of created like an extra layer in there. It wasn't just like a straight up romance. Like it was like you had the whole danger of them kind of like having to hide their magic and the consequences of them revealing it to somebody like there was like this whole like extra element that I thought made it like so much more fun so I definitely think Charmless was like a have to read it's, like kind of along similar lines to the story that I'm writing for Project Purple um where you and, like Project Purple is an urban fantasy and it also is a romance and you have like that magic system and I would say that my story was like the charm list for an older audience and also like different um, because it's not dealing, it deals with different issues, um, but has that underlying theme of like the same idea kind of ish a little bit. So I definitely think the charm list was super good and that you guys should read it if you haven't. And the last book that I read, I wasn't sure that I was going to like. Um, I'm not a paranormal romance kind of gal. Um, we have established very greatly in this video that I'm not much of a romance kind of person. Um, not much of a straight up romance kind of person. Um, I also did not like Twilight at all when I read it back when I was in middle school. I thought it was really bad. Did not enjoy it even a little. Um, if people enjoy it, sure, go for it. Not for me. Not for me. So I've kind of steered clear after that of any paranormal romance because I'm like, mm, I don't know. But even so, um, I had no choice but to read the next book on the shelf. And that was Ghost House by Alexandra Adornetto. And let me say, I was pleasantly surprised by this one. I did not think I was going to like it. I thought that it was going to be, like, literally miserable reading it. But I will say, I didn't like it for the romance part. I did not think the romance was enjoyable. I thought it was very weird and very stretched out. I thought that it was just not for me at all, not my cup of tea. Um, but the paranormal aspect of it, um, especially the one character, 
was fascinating to me. I loved it. It was great. I literally just kept reading it to find out what this other character's story was. Um, so I think that this is like an interesting look into my tastes as a reader. Um, that I do love, I like when the characters get together and I like when like you people fall in love. I enjoy it, but I like when there's a, a little something more to the story than just the romance aspect. Um, I like a little more, a little more oof in my story, if you know what I'm saying. So The Ghost House by Alexandra Edeno tells the story of Chloe and Chloe recently lost her mother. Um, I believe in a car accident. I don't know that they officially ever say how her mom passed, but um, basically Chloe, since she was little, has been able to see ghosts and she hasn't seen them in a long time. But once her mother dies, the ghosts start showing up again at like her house in her room. Um, they're never like evil spirits. They're always kind of just standing there kind of watching her. Um, and Chloe just kind of doesn't know how to kind of turn them away. Um, she's kind of very stressed out after her mother dies and her grandma kind of notices this and says, hey, come stay with me in England for a while with me, you and your brother. Um, let your dad kind of grieve on his own and you come stay with me in England. She goes to England to go stay with her grandmother during winter break. Um, and while she's there, she meets this ghost named Alex. She is instantly drawn and attracted to Alex. Um, who is, might I remind you, a ghost. The only issue with this, other than the fact that he's a ghost, um, is that there is another spirit also haunting the grandmother's mansion house. Um, and her name is Isabel. And Isabel and Alex used to be a thing 157 years ago when they were alive. Um, and Isabel is not too happy that Chloe is there, as well as the fact that Chloe is into Alex and Alex seems to be into Chloe. Um, and so she has been spooking up the place and doing like a whole bunch of crazy things around the mansion in order to try to scare Chloe. Um, and she is a very evil ghost. Um, she has, as a ghost, killed people in the past. Um, and she w is not afraid to do it again if it means that she and Alex can be together forever. Um, and so I loved the book for Isabel's plotline. I thought it was fascinating. I loved kind of getting the little bits and pieces of her story and like finding out more about her and why she was so angry. Um, I thought that it was just really good. I liked that part of it. The romance part I could have left behind. I get that that was like the big part of like why um, Isabel was mad and like it was a hint into like Isabel's whole story. But I don't know. I felt like it was like too insta love. Like literally like it was like not even like their first time meeting and Chloe was like, I think I love him. Like, hold on. Slow your roll, girl. Please. Um, I literally just wasn't too keen on the romance aspect. And I think that that was like kind of the theme of this I read it all was that like the romance really like threw me um I feel like I'm not normally overly bothered too much by it um I just wasn't overly impressed or happy with them um I mean the romance in Children of Blood and Bone was great Charmless was great. Loved it. There wasn't really any romance in the Red Ribbon. But the other three, the romance aspects, I was like, just like could not get behind it. Was not feeling it. I think, honestly, now I'm thinking about it and talking about it. I think that one of the problems was that the author for these books, so the Cool for the Summer, Home Field Advantage, and even Ghost House, they didn't give us enough of a reason as to why the characters should be together, um, as to why they were so drawn to each other, um, what it was about this specific person that they liked so much. Um, cool for the Summer kind of did. They explain a little bit that Jasmine kind of like pushed Lara into changing a little bit, but even that was kind of like very like short-winded and not like enough of an example as to why. Um, I just feel like there were kind of just a lot of uh, like rushing through the build-up of the romance, and maybe that's why. I feel like maybe that's why. 
because now that I'm thinking about it, like the Charmed list, there was a lot of history like before, and it was like kind of like a very like slow build up to them being together. Um, and Children of Blood and Bone was kind of like the same because there was like a lot of build up before the characters got together. I mean, this was like a hefty book, and like I would say the characters didn't get together until like 85% of the way through. So it was like a lot of build up and tension and the other books were kind of like, I don't know, 20 pages in for the most part, especially Home Field Advantage and Ghost House. We were like, maybe like not even 20% of the way in before the characters were like, I'm in love with you. And I was like, eh, mm, mm. like, I just, mm, I don't like that. I like when you have the build up. and I'm thinking I'm going to stick with that as my final answer of why I didn't enjoy those three books this I read it all session because it just felt too insta love and I can't get on board with that. The quote cool for the summer, I don't know. That was I wouldn't mm, I wouldn't say that was really like insta love. I think that was an issue of the characters. I think the characters were not in depth enough for me. Um and then Home Field Advantage, the characters were more in depth, but <laughs> at the same time it was like literally not that far into the book when they were like oh they got together and I just don't like books like that I like when there's like a long build up but that's why I like a series like I like when there's like a long build up to the romance and we get to get all the tension and we get to get all like the lingering looks but like when it's just like they jump into it I'm always like mm, don't really enjoy this um so I think that that's why I'm gonna stick with that as my reasoning for why those are the seven books that I read for I Read It All from October until December. Um, that kind of ends our 2022 season of I Read It All. I'm going to be doing a top highlights of I Read It All for 2022 and hopefully posting that soon, not long after this one, um, just so that I can kind of give you guys an overview of what I think the top books that you guys should be checking out are. Um, so yeah, so just a quick recap the five the six the seven books that i read um from october to december were children of blood and bone and children of vice not right children of virtue and vengeance by tomi Ediemi. um and then i read um cool for the summer and home field advantage by dahlia adler and then it was the red ribbon by Lucy Adlington and then it was The Charmed List by Julie Abe and then I finished off the year with Ghost House by Alexandra Adernetto. So that is going to be all from me for this I Read It All video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Um, the next one that will be coming like I said is going to be my top highlights for the year um and then hopefully not long after that i will be giving you guys the next series speed run which will be for the halo series by alexandra adernetto i'm about 200 pages into the first book um and it has much the same insta love that the other book did so i'm very interested to see how this is gonna play out because it's a series so we will see um there's three of them so that's going to be all from me. I hope you guys read some really amazing books in 2022 um, and that you guys have a very, very happy new year. Um, happy reading. Mm -hmm.